Um, and good afternoon, everybody. It's really wonderful to be here. Um, and kudos to the Royal Society and the Alluvian Foundation for convening this gathering, hopefully the first of many to come. Um, I'm going to be talking about some of the lessons that VIAC has learned over five decades or so looking at the conservation of public land in Victoria and um, forests um, with the view that we can take some of these lessons and apply it to that, that this new situation that we find ourselves in very fortunately. VIAC and its predecessors, the Land Conservation Council and the Environment Conservation Council, have played a really major role in our understanding and shaping the forest management across Victoria for the last 50 years. Um, VIAC is an independent body that provides strategic advice grounded in science with a 50-year history, as I said. It has significant convening power and has very strong and well-networked with stakeholders. For decades, we've been providing independent advice um, on the use and the protection of the environment uh, to the minister. Oh, it's not working, sorry. Um, okay. Um, and because, and you can see uh, a sentence from the VIAC Act there that really provides an, a nutshell explanation of what we do. And because we look to the future um, and because we can provide arm length um, independent advice from government, we can take on the really controversial issues and we have definitely played a part in working on some of the most controversial decisions on public land that's happened in Victoria. Um, an example of that is the Grampians National Park. Um, lobbying began early last century. Uh, the LCC did some recommendations in the early 90s and lobbying, um, it ceased, logging was ceased in 1994. That's about an 80 year time period. Similarly, with the Alpine Parks region, um, lobbying to make that a national park started in about 1949. VIAC investigated it in the early 70s. There were 14,000 public submissions to this particular investigation. I think, there's Paul here, I think it's probably the most that VIAC's ever received. Um, and it became a single national park in 1989. Um, just to emphasise the long-term nature of our work, when the LCC was established in 1971, the then Minister for Lands, uh, William or Bill Borthwick, famously advised the council to make recommendations on the public lands as if for a thousand years. And then he sort of left us to it. So public land use has inherent conflict. And one of the core values of VIAC is to seek out diverse voices and to listen respectfully. The LCC grew out of an environmental conflict for the Little Desert National Park in the early 1960s. The government wanted to clear that area for wheat farms, 48 I think, um, and there was a lot of pushback to that. So rather than deal with that hot potato themselves, they decided to form a council of experts um, and get them to deal with it and provide recommendations for the government to act on. I think this is a really powerful slide because it illustrates the role and the impact of those recommendations that the LCC, ECC and VIAC have made in conserving our native ecosystems on public land. So on the left, you can see 1971, there was just over 1% of native vegetation in national parks and wildlife reserves. I think there was only two categories back then. Um, and then on the right, you can see 2021, where there's more than 16% is being protected and in a much broader range of uh, protection land categories. That's about 36,000 kilometres squared, which is about the size of a small uh, country in Europe. So VIAC operates, um, it's not a black box, but there's, there's a lot behind that, the, the veneer, but we apply multidisciplinary approaches and collaborative government engagement. So it's really about integrating really strong science, the best science that we can get, with community values 
um, and traditional owner biocultural assessments, and then putting that together and analysing it to provide advice and recommendations to the minister. And this integration of hard Western science, social science, economic science is, is really critical um, for doing complex analysis on complex problems. And we have multiple feedback loops that feed back into the decision-making process. Our work has really evolved over time to meet the changing needs of Victoria, and we're certainly not doing the things that we were doing back in 1971. Um, and this has even been evident in my time as chair of VIAC, where we're working, we've really deepened our work with traditional owners, um, and we've been focusing more on specific areas or themes rather than sort of big regional investigations. And we've also introduced a lens to our work. And you can see that I've listed some of those here. These are things that we see are priorities for our work and are adding pressures on the things that we're investigating. Climate change, the biodiversity crisis, uh, traditional owner self-determination, and recreation and the increasing pressures that recreation is putting on our public land. In terms of our approach, um, we not only look at the biological values, you know, biodiversity threat status, um, endangered veget ecological communities, but also we look at cultural heritage, we look at social and economic values, and we look at the threats to them. And then we look at what are the best land categories, land use categories that are commensurate with um, protecting those values and reducing those threats. Often we'll do an economic assessment to look at the economic implications of that as well. Our community engagement is fairly robust. We have formal advisory committees that are established. I'm sure many of you have been on those over time. There are public formal submissions. Um, as I said, 14,000 for the Alpine area, 9,000 for the River Red Gum investigation that we did. And we also do a lot of direct consultations with community groups, industry groups, governments, local governments, environmental groups uh, as well. We've done at least 20 investigations that have included forest types. And I've just put some of the covers up there. The, all these reports are now available on our archives, which was completed last year during our 50th anniversary celebration. So all the reports and the, and the maps are there. These are some of the, a sample of the, some of the forest works that we've done, and you can see starting from the uh, mid-70s through to now. So what have we learned from all of that work in terms of forests, and what, what can we pass on to this new process that's underway? Um, so a few of the issues I'm going to go through now are things that are pretty consistent across most of those um, investigations, and they are that... Um, they are varied, um, it's very place specific. We heard that a lot during the morning session. Um, that the most controversial issue in, in all of them was where nature conservation vied with commercial timber harvesting um, around what the dominant land use was. And, and now we're in a very different situation and I think it's really useful just to pause for a second and acknowledge that as we go forward. Um, the other thing we've learned is that recreation is now the dominant public land use. And um, we've, we, we know that we've got just about zero data on, on what is happening and, and the trends in recreation land use. And it's the only major public land use without statewide spatial data in which to base our decision making on. So it's a real gap when it comes to making significant decisions around public land use when recreation is a big part of the picture and we have just very low levels of information. VIAC released a report earlier this year looking at the limitations of recreation land use and made some really good recommendations on how we can work to ameliorate that going forward. We also know that recreation uses are growing and changing. Um, COVID had a bit of an impact on that, but I think that it would have been happening anyway. And it's really likely that it's going to change even further with logging being removed um, and road maintenance probably less 
amenity and safety might be increasing. There are a whole lot of things that we need to consider what those implications are. I also want to highlight a few examples of where things were um, quite specific. So in the River Red Gum area uh, investigation, protecting those forests was more than just recommending a high, high conservation land use category. There were significant management issues that also needed to be included in those recommendations. For example, in this case, ensuring um, available environmental water was there at levels um, that would be considered quite modest today. Um, phasing out grazing along um, some of those public land areas in the Barmer forests and along river frontages. Back then, even, introducing processes of co-management with traditional owners and recognising some of their practices to be used. And addressing recreational issues uh, like dispersed camping along river banks, um, duck hunting on significant wetlands, those sorts of things. Uh, the Melbourne district, we had, um, it's a closed water catchment, as you know, so the quality of the water is a really big issue and that had huge implications on logging and recreational use. The box ironbark central west forest, they were highly depleted forest systems and they had um, mining and recreational mineral extraction issues to deal with there and specific recommendations controlling the depth where those sorts of things could happen. And then in our recent forest assessments, we're finding that dealing with um, threatened species conservation is a much larger issue than previously. The Leadbetter's possum, greater glider, um, some of the species we heard about earlier today. So our First Nations people have had a really long time building an understanding of and caring for Australian landscapes and ecology. And they've embedded that specialist knowledge into their cultural practices, and we've heard a heap about that this morning, which was great. We have much to learn from them. There are a number of emerging efforts uh, around Victoria and around Australia. Um, CSIRO, where I have a place, is doing a lot of work in this as well, trying to meaningfully connect the Western science knowledge system with traditional owner First Nations biocultural knowledge with the aim to build more robust and more fit for purpose knowledge systems. And VIAC ourselves are um, exploring this in practice with the Tangarung Land and Water Corporation using the Central Highlands as a case study. It's very early days um, and we're using the VIAC assessments and the biocultural assessments and cultural land management assessments of the Tangarung to identify areas where there are issues and obstacles, but also look at areas where we have alignment um, and where we can develop appropriate language to take this forward. We're, we're looking for bridging opportunities. We're looking for where there's sort of like-for-like -like things in both systems as, a, as an entry point. Um, a few are coming up, which is great. There's also a lot of complexity in this and I'm finding it quite disruptive because it's really, in a positive way, um, moving my thinking on from where, from where my original training was. Um, but one example of this is Western science has acknowledged that our single disciplinary empirical based um, work for problem solving just isn't cutting it and we need to do much more multidisciplinary system analysis work to deal with our problems. And that aligns really nicely with the socio-ecological adaptive systems of traditional owners. So that's one area where we've sort of identified that we're in agreement or we've got, not in agreement, we're, we've got a common understanding that this is a really powerful way to approach our problems. So I think we're in a really exciting place. Goodness, that's gone quick. Um, these are some of the challenges I think we need to look at as we go forward. Uh, there are many, but I've just put a few up here. We've got outdated public land categories for our forests, instruments of government obligations that really need to shift. I think that's pretty well understood, but it's going to be tough and it's going to take time. But they no longer reflect our values and what, what we want to use these forests for. 
There's a lack of understanding and agreement among experts, scientists, plenty of us in the room, but also communities as well, about how, what forest management is, should look like in the future. Um, I think the fact that we're even talking about it today is a really positive step, and we need to do much more of this coming together, putting our issues and concerns on the table and discussing them before we could move on. And then, of course, there's the backdrop of climate change impacts and building um, forest resilience capabilities uh, uh, to deal with those. Whoops. Oh, no. And then we have the opportunities. Um, we have an opportunity to design new land categories that better fit um, what we want across the forest estate, including traditional owner planning, management through the cultural reserves and, and, and other land tenures possibly. The current public land reform which is underway at the moment was the result of a recommendation in the 2017 statewide assessment that the VIAC did and we're really looking forward to that being developed because I think that's going to be really critical for this next chapter. We also have an opportunity to be informed by some of the transition work that's happening already because it includes community engagement work around what the desired futures for these regions and forests are and we can really leverage off that. There's an opportunity to also build community understanding and participation in forest management. I think the traditional owners can really show us the way here and we've heard a lot this morning about what it, gonna, what it could look like to have people in the forest, actively managing them. We have an opportunity to support traditional owner self-determination um, by realising the cultural landscape strategies and fire strategies and game strategies um, and also traditional owner country plans. And we have an opportunity to co-design this new future together based on a shared understanding about biodiversity conservation, but also what are the other values, tourism, recreation, those sorts of things. So this is my last slide. Um, I think we need to put all of these issues, as I said, on the table. Um, we've got some good perspectives in the room, not everybody. Maybe next time we can get more people here and have a, even more robust conversations. But I wanted to end with a few big questions we collectively need to answer together. What do healthy forests look like? And it so happens we had some presentations this morning that helped us with that question. It's something that we've been thinking about, not only in VIAC, but also in the eminent panel. What are our multiple values and what do we aspire to for our, future, for our forests in the future? Acknowledging this is going to be very place-based and forest type dependent. What knowledge systems do we need? Um, in some other work that I do, we use a lot of foresight and scenario analysis to help us understand some of these questions. And in VIAC, we've just started to talk about whether we could imagine a few scenarios where various things take place, fire management, different uses, see what that future could look like, um, explore that, and if we don't like it, we can put obstacles in place, look at a different trajectory. If we do like it, we can see what is it we need to do to get there. The other question is how can Victoria support this and what processes do we need to answer these questions and to go forward? How can we support self-determination and the traditional owners to accept their rights, privileges and practice cultural values? No one's really mentioned this but how can we fund the real management costs and implement the categories and the tenures and the management and, and the uses that we desire? Um, options for sustainable level of funding are going to be really critical to ensure that the, that level of management that we need is going to take place. Yeah, and finally, um, I guess it's a challenge to all of us. You know, can we go forward and together create and care for a healthy forest that will be there in a thousand years? Thank you.